Hi everybody, you're already familiar with if statements and for loops and while loops, but I want to highlight a couple of details that you might have glossed over in the intro course. Um, so here's a familiar kind of if statement. Um, one term, uh, piece of vocabulary you should know is that the expression that's inside the parentheses for the if, it's the test that you're performing, is usually referred to as a Boolean expression. Um, Boolean, of course, meaning true or false. So. One thing that you might not know is that you can take the Boolean expression out and evaluate it on a line by itself and save the result into a Boolean variable. So that's what's happening here on the right. Instead of having x bigger than y inside the if statement, sometime before the if statement I can ask, is x larger than y? And if the answer is yes or if the answer is no, either way it'll get saved into this variable called is larger. And then I can ask if is larger is true, then do this stuff. So this is another way of doing the same thing, but sometimes it's more readable and more convenient to perform your test earlier on and then use the result of it later. Something else that you might see in other people's code is a one line body for an if statement, which is valid syntax. So here I can say if x is smaller than zero, then replace x with the opposite of x. Um, we won't be doing this in our class, and if you do this in our class, I'm going to tell you not to, um, because according to our style guide, I consider this bad style, um, because it's very easy to go back and want to add more lines of code inside your if statement and forget to introduce the curly braces that define a code block, and now you have a bug. Um, and that's not just my class. Um, it's not uncommon for style guides to say that you shouldn't use uh, one-line bodies like this. Your if statements should always define blocks using curly braces. However, I just wanted to make you aware that this is valid syntax in Java. Okay, you're also familiar with if-else chains. So here we're saying if some condition is true, do action one. Otherwise, if a different condition is true, do action two. So you can chain together lots of different possibilities and have a separate action associated with each possibility. And of course, um, we only evaluate condition two if condition one was false. And we only evaluate condition three if the first two were false. So let's pretend that condition two is the situation that's happening right now. We'd say, is condition one happening? And the answer is no, so we jump to the else. And then we say, okay, is condition two happening? And the answer is yes, so we perform action two. And then because this if statement was true and we evaluated its block, we don't look at the else here, so we just exit this chain. One of the most common bugs that I saw students do last year, um, and it was a question actually in problem set zero, was this one. So let's pretend that we want to toggle the value inside a variable called turn. So if turn is something, like player one, we'll make it be player two. Otherwise, if it's player two, we'll make it be player one. So the problem with this is we only want one of these two things to happen each time we run it. Either it's player one and we want to switch it to two, or it's player two and we want to switch it to one. On the left here, if player turn equals one, both if statements are actually going to run because we'd say, is turn equal to player one? And in my example, the answer is yes. So we'd assign two to the value of turn. And then the code would keep running, and now we'd ask, is turn equal to two? And the answer is yes, because we just assigned it to be two in the previous if statement. And so, because the answer is yes, we'll evaluate this statement, and we'll put one right back in there. So without the else, both of the if statements will run. So when you're programming, you want to think, um, before you have a chain of ifs, whether you want potentially all of them to be true and execute all of them, or if they're mutually exclu exclusive conditions, if you only would want one of them to run. And if that's true, then you'd want to have an if-else chain, or in this case, it's just if-else. For the sake of completeness, I wanted to point out that uh, in my previous if-else chain, there was no else statement at the end, but you can always add an else at the end, which would run in the case that none of these if statements were true. So it's sort of like the default alternative action if none of the special actions executed. Here's another common bug that I see uh, people do sometimes. So if I'm not thinking very hard about the order in which this runs, I might say, okay, so if the percent is bigger than zero, then they get an F, but on the other hand, if it's bigger than 60%, give them a D, and if it's bigger than 70%, give them a C. The problem with this, 
Well, first decide for yourself if you can see what the problem is. Remember that um, as soon as one of the if statements is true, none of the other if statements will even run. So as soon as this first if statement is true, like if I got 100% on the test, it's true that my percentage is larger than zero. And so I get assigned an F. And then because this ran, we never even look at the rest of them. So that would probably make people sad if that's the way that you wrote your grading code. Um, so this is a case where if you wanted to do it in this ordering, you would want not if else chains, but a series of if statements. So that that way you'd ask, okay, I got 100%, let's assign an F. But then, without the else, you'd say, okay, is it bigger than 60? And then you'd assign a D. And then you say, is it bigger than 70? You'd assign a C. So if that's the ordering, you wouldn't want the else's. Um, probably better, though, would be to keep the else's and just uh, reverse the ordering. So first you test if it's 90, and if it is, you give them an A and they're done. Otherwise, if it's not bigger than 90, then you check if it's bigger than 80, and so on. Okay, quick reminder about and, or, and not. Um, and I like to pronounce and also. So we'd say A is true and also B is true for, uh, for that to evaluate to true. Or, or it doesn't mean the same thing as or in English. It means A is, or, A is true or B is true or they're both true. And then not, I usually pronounce the not beforehand. So I'd say it's not true that A. So here are some examples. Here we're saying if n is larger than 5 and also n is less than 10. So in other words, is n between 5 and 10? Here we're saying if n, if the remainder when you divide n by 2 is 0 and also the remainder when you divide n by 3 is 0. So in other words, if n is divisible by 2 and also n is divisible by 3. Here we're saying if n is not 1 and also n is not 2. For the ors, we're saying is it true that n is less than 0 or larger than 10? Is it true that n is divisible by 2 or divisible by 3 or both? Is it true that n is 1 or n is 2? And finally, is it true that, uh, sorry, is it not true that the message equals high? In other words, is it true that the message isn't high? There's a couple of common bugs uh, for these as well. Um, so one using the not symbol, uh, when you're using the not symbol with uh, numerical comparisons, remember that there's usually an easier way to do it. So what does it mean if it's not true that number is bigger than 10? Well, it must mean that number is less than or equal to 10. So generally speaking, you shouldn't use not if you can express the same idea using ordinary comparisons. Same thing here. Is it not true that num equals zero? Well, that's like saying is num not equal to zero. So you should definitely do the ones on the right hand side here. Here is a bug, um, or here, here's a common mistake to make. Let's say that you want to test if the user didn't type one or two. You might see that or in your English statement and say, well, let's test if user num not one or user num not two. The problem is that this is always true. Um, let's imagine, let's say that user num equals one. In that case, we ask, is it true that user num not equal to 1? That's false. But then here we ask, is user num not equal to 2? Well, that's true because user num is 1. And for an or, all it takes is one of these to be true for the entire expression to be true. So a different way of putting this is, it's always true that the user num isn't 1 or the user num isn't 2. Because if it's not 1, it might be 2. And if it's not 2, it might be 1. Or if it's neither of those, it might be something else. So in English, when we say we want to make sure that the user didn't type 1 or 2, what we really mean is we want to make sure the user didn't type 1 and also that the user didn't type 2. We want to make sure that the user didn't type either of those things. Um, so that's, I think, the most confusing situation where the logical or is not the same way that we use the word or in English. I also sometimes see students doing this. They'd say like if number less than 10 and number bigger than, sorry, if number less than zero and number bigger than 10. Well, this is never true because it's not possible for a number to be smaller than zero and also bigger than 10 at the same time. So keep your head out for those. Let's talk about loops. Um, so this is the standard for loop. 
In this example, I'm initializing a sum variable to zero, and I'm looping i from zero up to num, not including num. And here, uh, each time I go through the loop, I'm adding the loop counter into my sum. So this is a way of adding numbers from zero up to num. <clears throat> what you might not know is the order in which these evaluate. So um, when the for loop first executes, we do this uh, loop counter initialization. Usually this variable is called the loop counter because its job is to count how many times you've looped. So we initialize i to zero. Then we immediately perform the test and we ask, is i smaller than num? And if the answer is no, then we immediately exit and we never perform the body at all. If the answer is yes, uh, you can think about the loop test as being an if statement for should we loop again. So we're saying if i is less than num, let's run the body. So if it's true, we run the body next and the last thing we do is add one to i before going back to the loop test. So that's the order in which this executes. Init, test, run the body, then do the update, then go back to the test. Um, they're going to definitely ask you about details like that on the AP test. And also, sometimes if you don't know this, it can really interfere with your ability to program effectively. So let's look at those same elements for a while loop and a do while loop. So a while loop has those same things. We've got initialization, we've got a loop test, and we've got a loop body. Only the order in which they execute is a little bit different. Well, actually, it's not different. Um, here, we've, we initialize the variables, um, but we initialize them before the while loop ever starts. Then you have the loop test, which runs first thing. And if the loop test is false, just like the for loop, you never run the loop body. If the loop test is true, then you would run the loop body, and when you get down to the bottom, you go back up to the top and you perform the loop test again. So that sequence is the same as the for loop. For the do while loop, um, it's got the same ordering. The difference is that the test happens after you run the body. So we start by initializing the variables, then we run the body once, then we ask whether this statement is true, and if it's true, we go back and do the loop body again. So the difference is a while loop may never run the loop body even once, whereas a do while loop is guaranteed to run the loop body once, but then it might not run it a second time. Let's talk about nesting the loops. So if I have a for loop inside a for loop, the way to think about it is the outer loop variable will go from whatever to whatever. So here, outer is looping from one to three. But then for each value of outer, the entire inner for loop is going to start and finish before you ever do the second loop for the outer one. So for example, um, outer starts as one, and we ask, is outer less than or equal to three? And the answer is yes. So now we perform this loop. So while outer is one, we loop inner all the way from one up to three. And that's what's producing this output over here. So you see in my print statement, I'm printing outer first and inner second. So this first number is outer, and this second number is inner. So while outer is its first value, while outer is equal to one, as you see here, we're looping inner all three times. So inner goes one, two, three. And then once that for loop's done, we print stars once here. And now finally, we're at the bottom of the block for the outer for loop. And we go back up to the top, add one to outer, so now it's equal to two. And then when outer equals two, we do the same thing. Inner goes all the way from one to three, which you see here in the output. So while outer is two, inner goes from one to three, and then we print stars, and then we do the last iteration for the outer. So that's a pattern you can use if you want to uh, loop over all pairs of values between something and something. One thing you might notice though is if the order of the pairs doesn't matter, like if one, two is the same as two, one, we visit each pair of numbers twice because outer starts at one and goes up to three and inner starts at one and goes up to three. So here, one, two, we, we got when outer was one and inner was two. Here, two, one, we got when outer was two and inner was one. So what if you don't wanna have repeats of your pairs like that? What if you only want pairs of unique numbers. You could do this. You could say, let's loop outer from one up to four, and let's start inner at one larger than whatever outer is. 
So an easy way to think about that is let's loop outer through all of our numbers and then let's loop inner through all values that are larger than outer. So here when outer is one, inner starts at two and goes up to four. Then when outer is two, inner starts at three and goes to four. And when outer is three, inner starts at four. You'll need to use both kinds of nested loop in the very near term future, like probably week two. Um, so it's good to know the difference. And this is probably not very interesting to just look at slides. So if you want, if, if it didn't make sense to you or if you feel like it would help you remember, definitely go and type these out yourself and tinker around a little bit to get a feel for how they work. Thanks for listening.